Hello, welcome back to the Spectrosonics Omnisphere tutorial. We're finishing our look at the modulation um, settings today. And the first thing that I want to deal with is the one option that we haven't talked about in the left-hand page, which is smooth. Now, this emulates what in the analog world might have been called a lag processor, and it introduces a literal delay, a kind of softening of the effect that the modulation source can have on the target. A good example of this is to get the wheel modulating our pitch and by default we get this kind of the pitch varies as soon as I move the wheel. If I maximize my smooth setting however and do exactly the same thing you hear I moved the wheel at exactly the same speed, sent it straight to maximum, and then there was this lag, this delay before the modulation kicked in. And it smooths the, the edges off the change that the modulation uh, source can have. And this is true for all settings. We haven't dealt with random yet, but it's pretty obvious. This is going to apply a random modulation every time I press a key. So with minimum smooth, and maximum, you're going to hear it's going to be pretty quick, but there is always a, a little sweep up to the note. So it's not a, it's not a big effect, but it just take, takes the edges off those, um, those dramatic changes. Let's have a look at bias, see what this is all about. So this graphical representation gives you a good idea of what bias does. It's a little bit like key tracking that we've got in um, other options around the synth, but it's actually centered around a bias point, which means that above or below, depending on what options we've got set, uh, modulation has no effect at all. <clears throat> and then it kicks off and takes over from there. So if I set a bias to C3, now something about the Omnisphere that I should point out, it's C3 isn't necessarily what the rest of the world sees as C3. You see it goes down to C minus one. Typically and particularly with Cubase and most VSTs that I'm aware of, MIDI goes down to C minus two. So for some reason Omnisphere is one octave offset. I'm, I'm, I'm not a fan at all. But this C3 here is really kind of C2 on the keyboard. And what that means is that because I've now got my bias um, mapped to my, to my pitch change, any notes above the C2 that I press on the keyboard is going to have an additional pitch modulation applied to it, but everything below C2 slash 3 is going to be completely unaffected. We can see that really easily by muting or unmuting the effect. I'm going to press a uh, B. So this is a B1, one note below the note when things are going to start happening. And now I'll press the C2 itself. So that's the center point around which the axis rotates. And finally, C sharp 2. So we're starting to hear an effect when I unmute the modulation, when I let it loose on the note it's applying a, a slight bit of extra modulation. It's, it's about half a semitone. For every note that I go up, that modulation is going to accelerate, it's going to increase because this is a linear slope. By the time I press a C3, we're going to get an A3, which is nine semitones higher than the note I've just played. Let's play a C4. And we're now over an octave above so it's constantly accelerating that acceleration can be accentuated by pressing the 4x button but now everything is just multiplied by 4 it's literally that simple so my root my basic c remains completely unaffected but that c sharp that used to be half a semitone higher is now two full semitones higher so curious little one um if we switch to left then it literally inverts all of that logic. So now all of the notes below 
C2 will be biased. I'll press B1. So there's our D2, which is much higher than it should be. So don't forget the, the bias is still a positive bias. It's just affecting the notes below <laughs> the bias point. The other one I wanted to have a look at was morphing source. Now, this is the point at which I go, whoa, Omnisphere. Thanks very much. Not for me, but I will I will show you how it works. I think this is a little bit mad. In order for me to set up um, the morphing source, what this is basically, basically going to do is merge two different modulation sources together and apply them to a single destination. And we need to use the modulation matrix in order to do it. So let's say we want to affect the filter cutoff. And the first thing, we need four rows of the modulation matrix to accomplish this effect. And the first row says that our morphing source is going to output to the cutoff. So that's the thing we're going to be affecting. Now we need two separate modulation inputs. So let's make the first one an LFO. And we output that morphing modulation input A. The second one I'm going to set to velocity, set that to input B. And finally, we need a master control that allows us to mix those two modulation sources together. I'm going to use my modulation wheel. And that is set to morphing input AB crossfade. Don't you love it? So that's how you set up this, this morphing option. Absolutely insane, as I say. So now, depending on where my modulation wheel is set, we're either going to get an LFO-based variance of the filter cutoff or a velocity-based variance of the cutoff. Now, you can see the LFO cycling merrily away in the background. So I'll press a, I'll press a key and we'll just see what we've got right out of the gate. Uh, in order for us to hear this effect, we have to engage the filter, which I totally didn't not just forget to do. Let's get back in. Okay, so every time I'm hitting the keyboard, you can see the little white light telling me how hard I've hit the key is having an effect on the filter. But that LFO that's cycling in the background isn't. If I move the modulation wheel all the way to maximum and press the same key, there's my cutoff. I want to make it a little bit more dramatic. key harder we'll get a different fundamental tonal sound and then bring the LFO in and we get a different colouring so these two effects are basically being summed together and, and the amount by which each of them is being allowed to affect the destination is being controlled by our morphing input crossfade control. Do with it what you will. I simply present the information to you. I think it's a bit much for my liking. I'm going to initialize the patch, throw all of that away, it goes back to our simple sound. Now we've not dealt with effects yet, but one thing I do want to show you while we're deep into the modulation world is that if we have effects engaged on this patch, then in our modulation matrix, we get new effects available to us. And you can see that's the flame distortion I just added. So basically every setting in all of the 58 or so effects that Omnisphere has to offer are all modulatable. 
but we'll deal with that more comprehensively when we get on to talk about effects. I just wanted to show you that that feature was there. Finally, let's have a look at how multiple layers interact in the context of the modulation matrix, because this mod matrix is um, at the patch level. So these 48 slots that we've got available to us, there's 12 here and four pages of them, that's for the entire patch, that's for use by the entire patch. So if layer A has the envelope mapped to pitch course, and we have a look in our mod matrix and there it is. If I now map a new modulation value on layer B, let's say I modulate the resonance with the modulation wheel, you can see that we, we've got the wheel to resonance modulation, but the previous value that we set, um, the pitch modulation on layer A is now grayed out. So when we're looking at the modulation matrix, we're only seeing the controls that have a relevance to this layer. And we see that the other layers have slots assigned to them and they're still live, they're still active. If I press a key, you're still hearing layer A. There's the pitch modulation in the background. We just can't edit it from inside the matrix in a different layer. If I head over back to edit layer A, then suddenly this option is highlighted and the second value, which is assigned to layer B, um, is disabled. Now I did some editing on layer B and I can activate it and we can hear both of those two sounds simultaneously. But the pitch variance is only currently being assigned to layer A. That doesn't have to be the case. If we come back over to our modulation window, on our target options, if I drop this box down, can you see this option underneath is called modulate all layers. If I select that, now it's ticked. It means this pitch variance is going to apply to all four layers. So if I just mute layer A, that's layer B that you're hearing with the pitch variance being applied. But if we head over to layer B and head over into the mod matrix, we still can't edit the pitch control. That mapping was created during a layer A editing session and layer A owns that modulation matrix slot, even though B is currently using it. And in fact, B is the only layer that's actually um, having an effect on this sound at the moment. Layer B still is not allowed to edit that mod matrix value. So it's a bit weird, the fact that you've got modulation matrix values that are being assigned to layer B and exclusively in use by layer B, we've shut layer A off, it doesn't matter. You can still only edit them from inside layer A. And that's it. Hopefully you're armed now with enough weapons to go away and investigate the other options. From this point onwards, everything is pretty self-explanatory. You know, your random options kind of speak for themselves. The targets that we haven't explicitly dealt with. All of the, the, the modules as we deal with them one by one. Remember when we dealt with the oscillator and we broke it down into each of the individual sub-features? They're all here. You know, all of these options should be familiar to you and you know what they all do. Immensely powerful, really fantastic implementation of a modulation matrix. I love this one. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please consider subscribing, hit notifications. I'll catch you for the next episode.